Hello, and welcome to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast, a resilience podcast where we talk about all the challenging things that we're working to overcome, like anxiety, health, and relationship issues. My name is Sarah. Welcome to another episode of the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. I'm happy to connect with you this week. My name is Sarah. So this week we are headed into November. Things are getting a little more dreary, but I am excited. I am going to be doing a sunny vacation soon, so that will definitely be lifting my spirits. But um, I did want to leave an episode for everybody and a few episodes within November. This week we're going to talk about how to raise confident kids. This is certainly something that has been on my mind. I mean, we've talked on the podcast a few times about raising confident daughters. Um, We did an episode around raising highly sensitive children. This one is going to dig in a little bit more to confidence and what are the links to confidence? How can we ensure that our kids believe in themselves and their possibility? Um, What do we do if our children are afraid to do something new? Uh, How can we manage that as parents? And, And not necessarily just parents. I mean, I think this is helpful for grandparents, for aunts, for teachers, just understanding a little bit more about what really impacts confidence in our children and how we can move through that. So we're going to speak with Dr. Kate Lund. She is a licensed clinical psychologist um, and has 15 years of experience in there. She's also a peak performance coach, a best-selling author, and a TEDx speaker. So her specialized training is in medical psychology, and it involves uh, the world-renowned Shriners Hospital for Children, Boston, Massachusetts General Hospital, and the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, all of which are affiliated with Harvard Medical School. She uses a strength-based approach to help her clients improve their confidence in school, sports, life, while helping them to become more resilient and reach their full potential at all levels. And I think that's really what um, we're always looking for for our children is that resilience piece. So hopefully you can get a few nuggets from this conversation with Dr. Kate Lund. So welcome, Dr. Kate Lund, to the podcast. I'm happy to connect with you today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Wonderful. So why don't we start with you telling us a little bit about your background as we start to get into this topic about how to raise confident kids? Sure, absolutely. Um, Well, so I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, I've been a psychologist for just coming up on 20 years. Uh, I'm a mom of 16-year-old twin boys, and they keep uh, my husband and I on our toes. Uh, Let's see, a couple other fun overview facts. Uh, I've been married for 25 years. I'm a golfer, always trying to get better. And I think that I will tell you, I'll say that my interest, my passion for helping kids to build confidence, build resilience, be able to move through and beyond challenge goes back to my own childhood when I grew up with a medical condition called hydrocephalus, which had me in and out of the hospital a lot, coming back to school, looking and feeling different, having to find ways to move through and beyond those challenges without shutting down. And, you know, it wasn't all me, of of course. I had a very, very strong uh, support system around me with my parents, parents of friends, friends, teachers, that sort of thing. Uh, But I would say that that's definitely a, a very formative part of my life and experience and an important reason why I do the work I do. Absolutely. I can totally see that. And just for your reference on the podcast, I talk a lot about um, my son has a disorder called PANDAS, um, Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcal Infections. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, he hasn't been in and out of hospital, but certainly like over the past, you know, eight years, we've been been dealing, you know, a lot of doctors, a lot of natural um, health practitioners, different things and kind of ups and downs of that. So I can um, definitely relate to your interest in this topic um, coming from there. And, and I think it's it's a really important one. Um, 
so why don't you talk a little bit more about why it's so important to teach our kids to manage their emotions and tolerate frustration? Sure, absolutely. Because, you know, that really is sort of at the foundation of everything we do, right? Because if we're shut down by our emotions, shut down by those moments that we become frustrated and, you know, as kids, as adults, we're going to encounter challenges that are going to, uh, you know, push us in directions where our emotions might be harder to manage. We might become frustrated to the point of having a hard time moving forward. So that's why it's really, really important to help our kids learn early how to modulate their stress response, how to make sure that they're in sort of an even space before the stressor hits such that, you know, they can ride the wave of the stressor as opposed to escalating to the point of shutdown when the stressor hits. So that's why it's so important for us to be kind of working with our kids in this way from a really early point. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense for sure. And I know um, especially within the pandas pans community of parents, we've got, you know, so many parents dealing with kids that are afraid to do certain things or their children have OCD. And so there's, you know, different fears that manifest in with that. Um, and so how can we start to deal, um, as parents with our children when they're afraid to do something and afraid to the point of shutting down? Like, what are some of the things that we can try to implement to, to keep moving forward? Right. Absolutely. That is such a great question. And I hear you because, you know, for all kids, there's that potential to be fearful, to be afraid to the point of shutting down. But then for kids who are struggling with sort of a medical challenge or a physical challenge or something along those lines, that sort of baseline fear can be intensified. It can be magnified in a sense. And so it's really important, you know, for us as parents or or educators or what have you to really start small, to encourage the child who's afraid to take small steps forward in a gradual way and start to experiment with what it feels like to be a tiny bit outside of the comfort zone and try to build on those small successes of taking those steps forward until there's some, some momentum built, built up. And, you know, for a child who's struggling with a medical condition or physical challenge in some way, it's going to take more time, right? It's going to be a longer process, but just to stick with the child and encourage that forward motion, because over time, they will start to desensitize to the fear and things will get easier, keeping in mind that there'll probably be, you know, steps forward and steps back, that sort of thing. But it's that consistency, it's that practice that helps us to help our kids to build an overall sense of confidence and and courage and take those steps forward when things seem so scary. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then that is really a a link there to building confidence, it sounds like. Um, And so I want to expand on that a little bit. Are there other strategies that you're suggesting um, to people that you're working with in terms of helping our kids to believe in themselves and kind of their future possibility? Right. Yeah. You know, so another really gr- great question. And, you know, there, there are a bunch of things, you know, that we talk about. And one such thing is this idea of helping our kids to manage expectations, both for performance and outcome, because, you know, some days will be better than others. And so we want to help our, our kids to set goals, both short term and longer term, but not set their expectations on a specific outcome. Because if things don't turn out the way the child might anticipate, that might be a source of shutdown or, you know, disappointment to the, to the point of not wanting to move forward. So that's, that's really, really important. 
helping our kids learn to tolerate mistakes, be able to not succeed the first time out of the gate is really, really important. You know, for all of our kids, those who are struggling with something medical or physical, and just kids in general, because I really do believe that that ability to get up and try something again from another angle is ultimately the biggest catalyst catalyst for success for all of us. Okay, absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. And and that is something that can be really hard in this world. I mean, when you think about what some of the youth are dealing with with social media, you know, there's not a lot of room for mistakes. And so um, I think our society, you know, really struggles with that. And and I think that's a really good point. Like kids are naturally going to need to try things over and over and, and kind of get there. Right. And we also want, so another really important piece is we want to help our kids, particularly those who are struggling with the definitive challenge, to be able to pick out the things that are going well, as Mm. opposed to just focusing on the challenge, right? Because, you know, human nature is such that it's going to point us to, you know, the would haves, the could haves, the should haves, gosh, that was terrible, I should have gone better, I should have done this. But We want to really encourage ourselves as well as our kids to pick out the things that did go well on a given day. And actually, we have a a powerful exercise called the Daily Wins Exercise, where uh, we encourage our kids and we do this ourselves to sit down and jot down three to five things that did go well that day and then keep a record of that over time so that we can refer back and be like, oh, okay, well, yeah, it's not so bad, you know, that kind of thing. Obviously, we have to contend with the challenges. Those are very real. But we also want to pick out those things that are going well. That's really interesting because I literally was just about to ask you that question. You know, what I, what do you do when a child is very focused on, you know, maybe that one aspect of their life that is not going as well, but yet maybe they've done, you know, really well at reading today or they've done, you know, really well on something else. And, and yeah, that's a great idea. So doing kind of a, like, I guess a journal, like kind of keeping a little booklet of them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then, yeah, what what you just pointed out is also really important. Um, You know, helping our kids to see their strengths, see those things that they're inherently good at or that they're developing in, right? And not just to focus on the challenges. So we want to really encourage our kids, again, particularly those who are struggling with a a medical condition or physical disability, to focus on the things that they can do as opposed to the things that they can't do. Obviously, the challenges, as we've talked about, are important to contend with, but we really want to put an emphasis on the things that they can do and not the things that they can't do, such that we're not defining our child by the condition that they happen to have or the disability that they happen to have, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've heard even a simple example of that, that, you know, a lot of times when a child is struggling with, say, math, you know, you get them a math tutor, um, but that that can kind of put the focus on the negative instead of, well, they're honestly wonderful at music. So why not get the music lessons? Like it's, it's a tough balance, I think for parents, but I do see that it does have a bit of a message and an impact maybe on confidence. Absolutely. You know, and it's, it's such a hard question, right? The the Mm -hmm. math piece, you know, the math tutor versus music lessons, and maybe there's a balance in there. You know, the other piece in some cases on the tutoring continuum, you know, it's it's oftentimes our hope and our desire as parents to, you know, provide as many resources as we can to help our kids to work through a challenge. Mm-hmm. But I'll, I'll share a personal experience here in that last year, one of our boys was really struggling with math. And he was actually in a class that was a bit over his head. And so, you know, we started piling on the resources, you know, a tutor and and, and extra help in class and all this stuff. And what we ultimately found by springtime, a little bit too late, but anyway, uh, was that he was over tutored. When we pulled the tutor back and we were like, okay, 
these are the steps to follow in relation to getting help at school, it was a world of difference. So I'm not saying that that experience that we had is universal in any way, shape or form, but definitely something to think of about and definitely reinforces your point in that hmm, maybe music lessons would ultimately be more productive for that kid who has that passion, that aptitude for music, struggles in math, you know, and maybe there are other ways to manage that struggle than Mm -hmm. than tutor and to put the resources on the side of um, fostering the passion. passion. Yeah. And to spend more time doing the thing that you're not that crazy about, right? Like as an adult, we often don't do that. And so it is, it is a different way to look at it for sure. Um, And then getting back to what you were talking about in terms of if the child is maybe struggling with a disorder or a medical issue, um, not focusing too much on it. Like I know there is a certain amount of kind of comfort in being able to put a label to what's going on and sort of like a, well, this is why this is hard for me. You know, I have this happening, but so it's a, it is a fine line there as well then like we don't want to over over focus right because you know that will lead to your child or a child with such a struggle defining themselves based on just that one thing right mm-hmm. and we really want to try to help our kids see themselves outside of the context of the thing that they struggle with the most, if it's an illness or a physical disability, that sort of thing, it's easier said than done, right? Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. it's really, I I believe, important for us as parents to start in that place. Definitely not saying that we're not acknowledging the challenges of the condition or the disability in any way, shape, or form, because we must, you know, acknowledge those and manage through those fully. But to try to focus on, you know, the other aspects of the of the child such that other people, teachers, parents of friends, that sort of thing, don't come to define the child based on the, their condition or, you know, their diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Because that ultimately has the potential to hold a child back from really realizing everything that they're capable of in the big picture. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's great. That's a great point. Um, What about in terms of if your child has went through a particularly difficult time and you're kind of at that rebuilding stage? So an example I thought of was, you know, a period where maybe there's been a lot of bullying in their life, you know, and you're, okay, we've got, um, maybe it's therapy in place or, you know, switching to a new school, things like that, that you've put in place. How do you then start to build that child's confidence back up in terms of, okay, yes, it's been a really hard time, but let's, let's try to move forward. Any suggestions there? Yeah, that is such a good question because challenges like this can come up, right? Particularly, if a child is struggling with a medical condition, a physical disability that has them standing out as different when, where then there can be often is a bullying type of of situation. So the first thing I would say is for us as parents to be there and really hear our child's experience of the challenge. This is really the most powerful thing we can do. Just being there instead of trying to, jump in with a fix. Because as you know, as parents, that's something that we really want to do, right? It's hard for us to watch our child struggle. But really being there and listening to that experience on a human level is so, so powerful. And then from there, we want to try to help our child to, you know, appreciate what it is about them that's unique, to appreciate their own unique context, noting their strengths and what they have to offer the world around them, and really helping them to focus on that as opposed to aspects of their life and environment that they're not able to control, which first and foremost here in the case of bullying is another kid's behavior. 
doesn't make it any less painful, any easier, but really an important place to try to build so that the child is learning to focus on moving forward from the inside out based on their own set of skills and aptitudes. And then, of course, you know, getting the supports, and you mentioned this already, in place as needed, therapy, somebody else to talk to outside of the family. But really, the most important thing we can do as parents is to be there for our child in that kind of a situation and hear the experience. Okay, those are great steps. I really, I like how you laid that out for sure. And then that focus on strengths again, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, One thing that we haven't really touched on yet is that it can be really difficult um, for those that identify as females. There can be like a lot of pressure. And I know Um, I'm not saying it's, you know, not there for males, but I hear a lot about girls, um, you know, kind of hitting that teen age and then just really struggling with confidence. Are there any suggestions that you have there? I know I've been trying so hard to, you know, watch how I speak with my daughter. Um, You know, I know when I was growing up, people would call girls like bossy or you know what I mean like different types of things that really are like assertiveness and they really are positive things but for some for some reason for girls they can be um construed as like negative and kind of you're told to to kind of put those things away a little bit. And I just wondered, do you have any suggestions in particular around building confidence um in females in particular? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a really uh, great question. And I, I think that, you know, a lot of the, the principles that we've already, you know, kind of touched on really do apply across, you know, the, the gender continuum. And, you know, to encourage kids, girls, particularly in this case, to really be themselves, to appreciate their own unique attributes and their own unique context and sort of try to hone in on, you know, what their strengths are and how they can give back to those around them. And, you know, there are always going to be moments where kids, girls, boys, what have you, are misunderstood or, you know, they, they come across in a way that, uh, perhaps wasn't intended. And so it's in those moments that as parents, we again can step in to be there and hear the experience and try to understand where our, our, our kids are coming from and try to give them constructive feedback on how to move forward, how to move out of the gate the next time. Does that, does that make sense? It's, it's, there's really no one mm-hmm. size fits all. It's just sort of a a process of building up uh, this idea of confidence and um, direction and how we're going to encourage our kids to give back to the world over time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I like what you've mentioned there about being yourself. I think that's one thing that I hear a lot um, is especially females, you know, and and even as we get older, you start to identify it like my age that, okay, I've spent so long trying to please people. I've spent so long paying attention to other people's needs. And so kind of tuning into that self, I think can be really challenging. So I think that's, that's a good tip. Um, Any suggestions on, you know, if a child says, well, I'm not really sure, like how to be myself to, to try to work them through some thoughts around that? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a really interesting, um, interesting question. And I I think what I would say to that is really trying to understand where the child is coming from. So how are they defining themselves? You know, how do they see themselves and try to build from there and really kind of talking about and talking through this idea of comparison, 
and trying to help our kids to see that although easier said than done, you know, it's, it's best not to compare ourselves to others because we are who we are and we, we are really only able to kind of control and build on ourselves and what we have to offer from that perspective. Um, and I, I think really just trying to, again, understand the experience in it all is going to be the first and foremost thing to do. Mm -hmm, for sure. Yeah, no, a lot of that comes out through conversation. Um, any other like activities that you find can really help kids to build confidence? Like I'm thinking, you know, we've talked a lot about conversations with parents, maybe therapy, maybe like a journal type situation, but anything else that you've kind of seen over your time in this field? Yeah, well, absolutely. The, the, really the foundational piece is going back to the first piece that we talked about managing stress response and really helping mm -hmm. our kids to develop some way to do that consistently day in, day out. You know, for some kids, you know, they, we can teach them medita simple meditation techniques, simple breathing techniques. Um, kind of ways to shift gears in terms of what they're thinking. We want to be promoting in our kids, helping them to develop a really strong foundation in positive self-talk, for example. Um, and so if we hear them saying something negative about themselves, we might jump in and say, hmm, what, 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 what are you thinking in that moment? What, did, what does that mean exactly? How might we look at that differently? that kind of a thing. We want to really encourage our kids on all of those fronts, but I would say that teaching them a concrete technique or way to modulate their stress response, kind of have this sense of evenness throughout the day such that they're ready when a stressor hits is the most important thing we can do. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I know growing up for me, it was definitely being involved in music. And then as I've gotten older, it's, you know, more things like exercise, but mm -hmm. um, it's hard to, you know, as a child, find all of those things. And and I think so as parents, we can kind of hopefully expose our kids to to different ideas. Absolutely. That's so, so important. And again, right, you make a really important point. It's not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. You know, it might be music for one kid. It might be exercise for another. It might be, you know, uh, a walk in the woods for another. It might be art. You know, there's a lot of catharsis in art for many, many children. So not a one size fits all, but it's finding that thing that will help a child to manage the response to the challenges, to the stressors that are inevitably going to hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what about to like, I'm thinking of a situation maybe where you've got somebody I know you've done some work around um, sports, like someone that's like a competitive athlete, and they're just kind of like lacking that confidence out there to get to the next level, any kind of exercises you would suggest in a case like that? Yeah, you know, so two things, and I know I'm going to start to sound like a broken record, but see a lot of these tools and techniques overlap across, um, across domains, right? But when a kid is having a performance block in a sport, um, first and foremost, we want to help them to be managing their emotions out there. And we also want to be helping them to manage their expectations, we want them to be focused mostly on the process goals in terms of how are they playing as opposed to the outcome. And we saw that. Um, I don't know if you're a, a tennis fan at all, but we saw many of these points made in the women's final at the U.S. Open this past weekend um, where uh, – the coaches were talking about those very points and I could not agree more to managing emotions out there and managing expectations so that you're not so fixated on the outcome, but rather focused on the moment to moment and recognizing that if you don't win a point, 
you can start fresh and move forward from there. Excellent. Yeah. And, and, you know, definitely I can totally see that in the tennis example and then even team sports. I mean, you know, you're not responsible for the full outcome, right? Like all you can do is contribute what you can. Um, so I think that does make a lot of sense to kind of shift that focus. Precisely. That's huge. Exactly. Because as a single player in a team context, right, you can't be responsible for the overall outcome. You're focused on what you're contributing, doing your very best in that moment, in that context, whatever that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, great points. Um, I just also, before we wrap up, um, I've really appreciated this conversation, but any other tools, advice, or just thoughts that you'd want to leave listeners with? Well, you know, I, I think the biggest piece there is this idea of believing in possibility, both for yourself as a parent, as well as for your kids. Always believe in that possibility on the other side of those challenges that will inevitably come along, but particularly those challenges related to having a child with a significant medical condition or physical disability, that sort of thing. Believe in the possibilities and really find those strengths in your child in terms of what they're bringing to the world. Absolutely. That that definitely makes sense. So I'm sure listeners are going to want to find out a little bit more about you. How can they find you either online, social media, if they want to connect? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So my website is www.katelundspeaks.com. So that's one place to find out a little bit more. Uh, I'm also very active on LinkedIn and would love to connect there. And I have a podcast called The Optimized Mind, which is another great place to connect with me. That sounds great. Okay. Yeah, I will definitely check out your podcast. I love to listen to podcasts of different people that I've had on my podcast. It's always really fun. Um, So wonderful. I really appreciate your time today, Dr. Lund. Um, I think this has been some really great points for us to all kind of look at how we're parenting and see what we can move along on and, and do a little bit better and how to build that confidence in our kids. So I appreciate that today. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it as well. Thank you so much to Dr. Kate Lund for sharing all of her experience in terms of raising confident kids. I really appreciated her providing her background and some of the in and out of hospital that she was in. I think it really gave us some good context to understand uh, some of her insights. And I think that there is just an endless amount of work that we can do here, and it is so worth it. Um, I loved her focus on Uh, putting children into sports. I think that that can be such a great um, way to build confidence and also beyond sports, even just helping our kids to find, you know, what makes them feel unique, where their strengths are, uh, ways to kind of gain that confidence. And I think that she provides some really wonderful expert advice and you can find out more about her on the web at katelundspeaks.com, her podcast, The Optimist, Mo- Optimized Mind, um, and also she mentioned LinkedIn. So I know many of you are parents or teachers and I really hope that this can give you some ideas of how we can support those young minds and hopefully raise those confident children that uh, that we'd love to see develop. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. Please keep in mind, this podcast is not intended to be medical or professional advice. If you'd like to hear more from me, you can follow me on social media, Instagram and TikTok at Sarah Lady Gluten or Facebook, Sarah underscore Gluten Free Lady. You can also visit my website, which includes author information, speaking information, and more info on the podcast at www.se-german.com. If you like the podcast, please feel free to review the podcast on your favorite platform and also subscribe because it means that it will show up for you every week on your favorite podcast platform. Also, we've just started to have the ability to support the podcast. 
You can find this link in my Instagram bio or visit Kofi, K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash learning to slay the beasts. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.